Hello and welcome to The Bat. This is episode 52 for the 1st of May 2016. My name is Franco and joining me is Dean the Strong. Not joining me today is Jason of Feeble. We, <laughs> we are broadcasting from the Progressive Bubble. We're on this day in 1946. Indigenous Australian pastoral workers in the Pilbara region of Western Australia commenced a strike that would last three years, for which they were seeking human rights recognition and payment of fair wages and working conditions. Vincent Lingari? Who's in what now? Is this, is this the story of uh, British Lord Vesti and, and Vincent Lingari? As sung about by uh, Paul Kelly. Well done, yes. It took Kelly me a while did. to get there. I've yeah. actually seen him live in, in concert recently. Oh, well, really? Semi recently, like nine months ago. But I, I'm shocked that I forgot his name so readily. He's a singer I've always wanted to see. And I had the opportunity two years ago to see him in Kings Park for a Day on the Green event, but it rained and I'm a bit soft, so I bailed on I it. also saw him at a Day on the Green event uh, more, more recently than that. He was playing with uh, Tim Finn, I think. Oh, okay. And he, he eclipsed him. Oh, wow. Yeah, obviously, the Kiwi's filthy and they deserve that. But um, <laughs> just amazing, amazing life. Well, I mean, just by the, the strength of the content, that the topics he sings about, he's just... An amazing... I quite like the fact that he doesn't... It's not love songs. It's not like your everyday thing. These are actual stories that he's telling. It's beautiful song structure. So, But, you know, uh, to, to, to return to the point, so this obviously is uh, when Gough Whitlam got involved and then gave them the sand... I'm not sure. Sh- I'm not sure if that's the one. That might have been another one. Uh, to be honest, from little I, things, big things grow. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's that one. Okay. I think that was another one. Because um, those names don't ring a bell. While I was quickly glancing, I didn't obviously do a lot of research in this particular one. But I know the one you're talking about, and I think that's a different one. Um, so, anywho, um, douchebag filters this week, just to keep people like weak. J- sorry, Jason the feeble out. Yes. <laughs> we, we, sh- we shall uh, test I feel, his uh, moral fortitude. I feel he's earned this. He's he's more absent more often than anyone else. Exactly. Feeble. Weak. <laughs> it's a bit very jeb of him. Low energy. Low energy. <laughs> um, so this week, I took up the dual challenge of watching uh, the first episode of Fear the Walking Dead and uh, the first two episodes of Containment. So Fear the Walking Dead season two? Season one. Back? Season one, okay. So I'm right at the beginning. S- I haven't even... To bother to the second season. Season one, that pilot episode is is a bit of a rough patch. I found. I did as well. I feel. I don't know. This, this is the advice I'm going to give to anyone who wants to make a zombie movie or zombie TV series. You need zombies. Yeah. Having a whole episode talking about feelings and emotions and not having a lot of zombie content is really annoying. The acting is also not great in that first episode, particularly the son, the junkie son. I didn't like him at all in the pilot. He gets better. He must right. have got a coach or something after the pilot, but I just found him really, uh, he grated on me a lot. I haven't watched Containment at all, but it does come highly recommended. What, what was your views on Containment? Um, once again, an over-focus on emotions and relationships. Right. And this is a theme, it's not just those two shows in particular. A lot of these zombie or apocalypse type shows focus heavily on these relationships. And it got me to thinking like, if I found myself in you know an apocalypse or zombie apocalypse, all that sort of shit would go out the window for me. It's be it's Raw kill survival. or be killed. Yeah. So you'd be society's uh, out the window. Would you have a bunch of men following you around? I'm shoot funny first, tunes? ask questions later. You'd be like Negan, Walking Dead style. Uh, I don't think I'd in, enjoy or embellish the violence, but uh, you know I'd take the world for what it was at the time. Right, which is a harsh place. Mm. It's always a bit of a harsh place. We just have to live in a nice Western country, which I'm fortunate enough to do. Mm. <laughs> so um. I th- there's enough in containment to keep me going. I've always been fascinated by viruses and the threat of, you know, an Ebola-style virus taking over the world. So there's enough there to keep me interested. And maybe to some extent, the same with The Fear of the Walking Dead. I'm not giving them, you know, two Franco thumbs up. No. And I wouldn't recommend them necessarily to people, but for pure lightweight entertainment value, there's something there. I, I found Fear the Walking Dead reminded me of all the worst parts of The Walking Dead. Mm. I only I only did the first season. I have, I have no intention of watching the second season. I don't care how good it is. I almost feel that way about The Walking Dead itself, though. Like it could just be a little bit of that bleeding over now. I've invested too much in The Walking Dead to walk away from it. I do have the same concerns and annoyances. I mean, I almost bailed in season two of The Walking Dead when it was all God Town. Yeah, and I was like, almost bailed again in the prison at the start, where everyone's had like a virus and they were getting sick. And yeah, I don't care. It's all just filler. Who who dies from a f- 
from a cold. Yeah, it, it doesn't sound like the most interesting part of the apocalypse you could explore. No. You know, if you've got a limited amount of time to explore certain issues, people getting sick is not one of them. And, and uh, there's already people sick. They're zombies. Yes. You're already exploring that topic. This is like a lesser version of it's just crap. Now, if Jason the Fever was here, he would be telling us right now that in the comic books it was different. And that was well, he would also be very... telling us that sickness is not something to be joked about. Mm. <laughs> so how about you? Got any douchebag filterage? I don't. I don't. I've been, I've been working hard. I haven't been watching television. I've, I've been watching Fresh Prince of Bel-Air reruns as I, I like to do. Um, <laughs> it's a revealing <laughs> um, guilty pleasure. I just quite enjoy the social commentary of the show. It still kind of resonates with me. And the, just the just Will Smith in general when he was young and, and making jokes about his private life and winning Grammys and stuff and imagining himself having television shows when in actuality all of that was happening. <laughs> Obviously, he's on a television show. Uh, so that that's all the douchebaggy sort of things I have been doing, I'm afraid. All right. Well, let's short fast it. We didn't bitch about Game of Thrones yet. Have I bitched about that on air? No, please do. Because we watched that together. Oh, Obviously, yeah, we did. We, yeah, we, yeah, we uh, didn't talk about that. I think it was the Monday. Is I think we ranted online. But Definitely online rants. I'm really unhappy with the fact they killed Julian Bashir. Chief O'Brien wasn't there to save him, I think, is the issue. <laughs> he was guarded by some twat who took a little <laughs> knife in the back and just went down. Yeah. Surely he, he would have seen this uh, treachery coming from a mile away. Yeah, I don't understand. And all the guards, all the guards, except for the head of the guards, have been brought up. He must have been the most incompetent head of the guards I've ever met. <laughs> not once did he hear any of his men bitching, not once did he hear anyone saying, oh, well, wouldn't it be a shame if Doran Martell got stabbed in the chest? No one said anything. There's this giant conspiracy. And with the um, execution of his son by the one of the um, vipers... Teleporting sand snakes. I would have thought that if you're going to make that much of a piss-weak effort to kill him, why don't you just flash to a dead body and then move on? Don't even waste our time with that little the, scene. The other problem I had with that whole scene is clearly this is something they thought up between seasons. Because why did they even let Jamie Lannister leave? Like, if you were going to murder the Prince of Dawn and the head of the guards, and the heir apparent, why didn't you just murder Jamie and Bronn when you had them in town? Yep. If no one's going to stop you... Clean sweep. That'd make much more noise against the Lannisters, who supposedly you want revenge against. Yeah. You just let you them go. You had one right there. <laughs> you had them right, yeah, you had them right there. And let them go. So, look, I just find that whole um, piece of writing very lazy. Yes. Uh, I hope they redeem themselves tomorrow. Same as with um, when they find Daenerys with the Dothraki. Oh, yeah. And just a very clumsy, oh, we're going to treat you mean, oh, you're the uh, ex-Khaleesi, oh, we can't touch you now. It's they just believe her as well, they take her at her word. Yeah. Some blonde haired girl goes, oh, I used to be married to a Carl, because I don't want to be gang raped. I feel like anyone would say that, they'd be like, yeah. oh, wait, is that the get out of gang rape free card? <laughs> I was one of those two. Um, it's weird, because in the, in the books, and I know I'm doing a Jason the Feeble moment here, in the books, she actually knows, uh, I think it's Joko, I'm not very good with the Dothraki names. Um, he was one of the blood riders of Khal Drogo. And after they all abandon her in that tent before she sets herself on fire and bears the dragons, he takes the Cal like the warriors and leaves. So when they meet up later, it makes sense as to how he knows it's Khal Drogo's ex-wife because he's fucking met her before. And exactly. I mean, it would, she was a Khaleesi. Yeah. You'd think that people would have remembered who she was. She was a blonde woman in a land of brown hair people. Yeah. All, all they had to do was have him go, you know, they bring, bring her for him. We've got this new woman. And he'd be like, ah, oh, sorry, boys. We know her. Remember that blonde-haired woman that used yeah. to be here that we've never seen before and never seen again? That's her. That's her. Can't, can't go there. It's Carl's wife. But obviously they wanted to make her a little bit more angry and feisty or something. Which is, look, it's fine for character. It just doesn't make any sense why they took her at her, fate, at her word. But other than that, I really loved what they did with Davos. I love what they were doing at the Wall. I love what they did with Brenda Tarth and Sansa and, and Theon Greyjoy who seemed to be finding himself again. There was a lot of, remembered it, it was just a fight. very mixed bag for me. Yes. It's, I think maybe there was a lot of clumsy editing. Yeah. I, and the other thing that bothered me was Tyrion walking around. Just chill. <laughs> I'm a merchant walking around as a dwarf with a fucking scar on his face when people are hunting him for murdering the king. Mm. Again, I know just go, in the books, he explicitly mentions, oh, I can't really go out in public because I'm pretty distinctive looking mm. and there aren't that many dwarves around. Well, I mean, aside from you know the Lannister bloodlust after him, he's in a he's in a city where the people just tried to overthrow the queen. Yeah, he's very recognisable part of that entourage. Yeah, it just it it, it was all a bit weird. Mm. He's hanging out with a bald man who was again a very recognisable part of that entourage. Mm. But um, look, if they maybe they can get that shit together. And the bit where they burnt the boats, they spent all this time getting the ninety six, ninety seven boats, whatever it wanted, to get them back to Westeros, and then off camera, there's like. 
Guess we're not going back to Westeros anytime soon. <laughs> you bastards. And it doesn't really make any sense why they would burn it. No, or how they managed to set 90-something boats alight without anyone noticing the smoke for the first 15. Maybe you don't notice the 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 10 because you've got shitty guards who don't really want to do their job. But once it gets <laughs> to like 15, 20, 30 boats on fire, that's a lot of smoke in the air. And Tyrion and Varys are like, oh, I'm just going to merch into round. Yes. Take stock of what's happening. Yeah, so good to see uh, that these people are just incompetent and shouldn't be running cities. Mm. And uh, as we were discussing online before, the script writing has been tight for the first five seasons. Yeah, it's been really, really tight. I mean, there was a couple of bits in the season five, again, with Dawn that bothered me. Uh, the bad pussy line, uh, that was a bit it was a bit dire. But um, by and large, not too bad. Mm. Up until now, I think they're just um, trying to clean up some mess they've made along the way. Yeah. And I'm hoping it's just that was the one episode they were like, right, we need, this is going to be a bit crap because we've hand fisted some stuff, but now we just readjust the story and then keep going. And so it's like a right. Liberal Party first six months of government. We're going to do all the nasty shit right up front and it's all good times after Well, and that. then we'll uh, swap out, swap in Turnbull. <laughs> we do all the nasty shit with T-Bone, swap in a Turnbull, you won't notice a difference. <laughs> all right, shall we short, fast news it? Let's do it. So speaking of uh, T-Bone, everyone's favourite political sniper and former Australian Prime Minister, this week he was on Sky News talking to Andrew Bolt from, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, saying that he did not expect the party to ever go back to his leadership. He says the wounds have subsided, the bruises have healed, and that right now he just wants to be the standard bearer for the conservative right and a vigorous member for Warringah. He admitted to making mistakes in the past, but he said he was confident that over time his achievements would shine and people would recognise the golden year for what it was. He didn't say golden year, but that's a bap joke. Uh, he then suggested that immediately after this, he said, look, an increase in debt levels ahead of the May 3rd budget well, sorry, increased debt levels would be a mistake. This with the budget due in three days, and we know the debt levels are going to go up because of all those fucking submarines they've just bought. And we've got no new revenue. And no new revenue, and they're going to give money to ASIC, and they're going to put money into education, and all this other stuff they're just making commitments to. T-Bone still can't help himself from just giving those little snipe shots. <laughs> but I like the fact that he's, he's sort of on message. It sort of leans more credibility that you know an election is coming, and we can get rid of these bastards. For a backbencher, he gets a lot of um, airtime, doesn't he? He really does. Uh, I mean, to be fair, Andrew Bolt's pretty um, conservative himself and pretty on side with Tony. He did mention that you know there are many people that would like to see Tony return, including himself, during this interview. So, did he mention how he felt he was backstabbed over eighteen C promises? Look, probably did. I didn't. I couldn't watch it. I don't like watching <laughs> people blow smoke up Tony's ass. It bothers me. But. Um, I watched the important parts, and that was just, you know, Tony talking about Tony. So hopefully, um, oh, I know, the other thing that was interesting was that Peter Credlin is now a columnist. I can't remember the paper she's writing columns for. I did um, see her column in the Sunday Times. I don't know if, she's, if it's a, but that's probably a part of syndication. So. Yeah, it is syndication, yeah. So she was talking again about, you know. She's talking the, about Bill Shorten. They need to get ready because Bill Shorten's ready. The Labour Party's ready. It's a good point she makes. Like, mm. I've seen a lot of policies coming out of the ALP. I've seen very little coming out of the coalition other than reactionary stuff. Mm. Such as restoring the funding to ASIC that was cut by Tony or restoring the funding to education that was cut by Tony. They seem to be doing a lot of restoration of things that were cut by Tony. Uh, and I'm looking forward to see how uh, Scott Morrison deals with all of this, considering his budget is now due in three days' time. I would dare say that you will see another format of Stop the Boats come out. We kind of are. Because that is such a winner for the LNP that some manifestation of it will come out again. There, well, I mean, I'm going to it's talk about this later in the show, but the Manus Island closure yeah. is going to be huge mm. for the election. It's a very badly timed disaster. But they, they could make a win out of that because Peter Dutton's, Potato Dutton, as we like to say, Constable Potato, has been saying they're not coming back to Australia under any circumstances. And I think they're going to use that as part of an election platform to say, we're still stopping the boats. Interestingly enough, um, uh, this is not, this is a part of the story, but it's not something I was going to talk about. But Maurice Payne, the Defence Minister, uh, also came out during the week and said that they will be looking at them on a case-by-case basis. Because as I'm sure you're aware, about 400 of the 800 or so blokes stored on Manus Island were deemed designated refugees. Mm. They are already granted their status. The other 400 haven't been assessed yet. Yep. But half of them are legitimate refugees and under international law, we're obliged to help them, to accept them. So we're currently seeing Potato Dutton talking about look finding somewhere else for them to go, mm. be that uh, PNG, be that Cambodia. I mean, we've put a lot of money into Cambodia to house two people basically now. Yeah, what was it, 60 million? So if we're going to house 800 of them, that's 
That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. So <laughs> look, the budget is looking like it's in trouble already. That's just going to make it worse. So look, it's interesting to see um, there's just this horrible disunity within the coalition as they sort of tear themselves <laughs> limb from limb. Well, I want to talk about um, one of my favourite journalists that um, I keep an eye out from week to week in the Sunday Times, Liam Barlett. He's a good man, isn't he? You know... I sometimes feel bad about picking on him. I don't know if he's a bad person. You know, it, it might sound like it the way I go on about him, but I don't know. But let, let's talk about today's topic. So this week in the column for Perth Now, Liam's piece entitled uh, was entitled "The Hypocrisy of FIFA Allowing Syria to Take Part in 2018 World Cup." So the main th- uh, thrust of his discussion in his opinion piece was uh, FIFA suspended South Africa from its football membership in 1963 which meant it could not field a national team in any international tournament. So this was in response to apartheid. And, you know, at the time you had a lot of countries um, uh, applying sanctions against South Africa. Sure. It was a cool Um, thing to do. The ICC banned cricket teams from going and touring over there. Countries were putting economic sanctions on there. I don't think America put any sanctions on South Africa, though. Probably not. However... Um, Liam decided to make a contrast about what FIFA did then about what it's not doing today. In his own words, 53 years later, FIFA must operate under an entirely different set of principles. In 2016, there is a country that has visited far more pain and suffering upon its population than ever recorded in the public of South Africa, a country whose ruler has been responsible for maintaining, oh sorry, maiming, torturing and gassing to death thousands of innocents and persecuting thousands of who don't share his religious beliefs. So he's talking about Syria. I couldn't tell the there for a minute. I thought it might have been America to start with. So um, I find he's a very brave man to sort of try and compare the atrocities and the depravities of what happened under apartheid versus the civil war and the Bashir government in Syria. It's certainly I, I a long boat to draw. Tra- yeah, I wouldn't want to be trying to say who's, who's worse than who, but Liam, he, he's quite happy to say, no, nope, Syria's worse. It's weird, isn't it? Because I feel like Syria is, is obviously it's a mess uh, and some bad things have happened, but the responsibility for those bad things, a lot of it rests with ISIS, which is essentially caused by America's invasion of Iraq. It has very little to do with Bashir al-Assad. Admittedly, his response to rebels is not great. However, I'm sure Liam's response to rebels probably not as good as well. Maybe we should be banning Liam Bartlett <laughs> from fielding a national team. I wouldn't mind banning Liam from writing opinion pieces. <laughs> so anyway, he, he waffles on for the rest of the article outlining why the Syrian regime and what the civil war is terrible and so forth. Well, fine, no, that's not in conjecture. But what I put into conjecture is why does FIFA have to be the world's policeman about who can and can't participate in events, and that's what well, one would say would be a slippery slope. How do you apply a framework to say, all right, who are you going to ban? So yeah. why, why only Syria? Why not Saudi Arabia? They're not. They're, they're like very bad. Just killing people. I mean, they're the head of the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, Frank. So they've oh. clearly turned themselves around. You know, did America get banned from participating in the World Cup when they were bombing the hell out of Laos? Nope. Nope. See, I I don't think you should be. I think isolationist policies are a bad idea. Mm. The more you put people into a situation where they're essentially like North Korea. And then the rulership has to create this propaganda engine to make people think that this is all normal and okay and we just don't trade with people because they're evil. And it just creates problems on top of problems. Oh, definitely. I don't think a sporting body should have anything to do with that. You should be encouraging these people to come together to enter the marketplace of ideas and compete in a sporting system that will get shown on on their home televisions as well. And they can sort of see what the rest of the world is like. Whereas Liam's policy seems to be just, uh, well, retarded. Well, As with everything Liam says. My problem with the Liam's piece is he throws all these facts in there and then makes no salient point. Mm. No one's arguing that um, FIFA should or should not have banned um, South Africa from participating in world events. And no one's arguing with him that Syria is bad or the regime. Well, sorry, what's happening in Syria is terrible or the Bashir uh, dictatorship is terrible. Although that's a much more complicated situation if you actually dig into it, what's going on there. It's, he does a lot of bad things, but it's a complicated situation that he represents a minority who's very f- afraid of what will happen to it after it get, if a Sunni majority takes over. But that's a whole different argument. My problem is, why didn't Liam try and tackle the more difficult issue about saying, all right, here, you have these two scenarios. How would FIFA actually go about you know, determining what, what the complexities in going down that path of saying you ban one country, but you don't ban another? I mean, yeah, it sounds hard. like a much... But he doesn't make that point in any sort of way. He's yeah, saying that FIFA's a hypocrite. But it's like, hold on. Well, I mean, they, they take bribes. So exactly. you know, maybe Liam could just bribe them 
into banning Syria. They've, there's a fairly well-established tradition of bribery within FIFA. Um, I, I Again, I just come down the side of it's not their place. It's they, they should be about football yeah. and, and not about political commentary. Exactly. Because it's too open to manipulation. You know, exactly. It's just, it'll look corrupt on top of the existing corruption in the organisation. And it also says, I mean, by banning one country, but by not banning another, are you making a comment on the ones you aren't banning? Yeah, are you I think you implicitly behavior? are. Exactly. Their so. behaviour is cool. Bad, Liam. Bad. Yeah, well, just maybe he had like a deadline and a hangover, <laughs> you know, and he had to sort of get a piece together. So he got all these facts and he's like, I don't know what point I'm trying to make here. The point I'm trying to make is I shouldn't drink so hard on a Tuesday. <laughs> so speaking of madmen, as if Donald Trump wasn't scary enough with his presidential campaign, the Philippines seem to be heading down exactly the same path and getting a populist campaign behind a very scary man. The presidential frontrunner, Rodrigo Duterte, and apologies if I say his name wrong, because I have no idea how to pronounce his surname. I can't help you on that one. He has promised to eradicate crime by ordering his security forces to just kill all the criminals. That's a noble plan. He also has in the past bragged about having had death squads when he was a mayor that allegedly killed 1,700 people. In any event, when he's president, he's promised that any police or soldiers charged with violating human rights will simply be issued a presidential pardon. And when he's done with his term as president, he will then issue, his last act would be issue himself with a presidential <laughs> pardon for mass murder. He noted that all of this is possible thanks to the Constitution. Constitution. He then joked, pardon given to Rodrigo Duterte for crimes committed in multiple murder, signed one Rodrigo Duterte. <laughs> and I had a big laugh about it. The crowd laughed along too. Of course, this man's known for his terrible jokes. Last week, he joked about the rape and murder of an Australian missionary in his country. He said that he was angry she was raped because she was so beautiful and that he, as the mayor, should probably have been allowed to go first. When the American ambassador and our own ambassador chastised him for those remarks, he told them to shut their mouths and then threatened to cut diplomatic ties if he was elected. Trump would be proud of this guy. <laughs> I mean, I think this, this notion of... Uh, it, it's like a sort of... It's not fascism, it's Trumpism. It needs a name. Yeah, it's, it's, it's odd. It's an odd, odd campaign. I just, I can't imagine what's going to happen. There's six-year single terms that they have in the Philippines. I can't imagine what it's going to be like sort of at the end of that six-year period. I and mean, if he starts cutting dip diplomatic ties with America and Australia, two of their major partners, and killing people en masse, and writing presidential pardons for it, this is just going to be a disaster. It's a disaster way to happen. And I, I'm just shocked that people are so keen to vote for this man. One would hope that the, the constitution of the Philippines has some checks and balances in case man men like this do get elected president. There is some sort of yeah, I don't way know. to um, stop some of these more crazy ideas being applied. Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed people of the Philippines come to their senses. Fingers crossed people of America come to their senses. <laughs> this is an intelligence test for both of your nations. Please don't fail. Well, we failed. We brought in Tony. We did. <laughs> Only once, though. We, didn't bring, we haven't yet voted him back in. I mean, he hasn't said anything. Oh, I, I even, Has he said anything totally outlandish? No, we seem to be chill with just keeping our violence limited to uh, asylum seekers. Mm. Um, and my final um, short, fast news, uh, and I hope it's short, um, is about um, New South Wales Senator David Lionhelm. That's a person you're very familiar with, Dean. I quite like Lionhelm. You've mentioned him several times on the show. Mm, he entertains me. He's a representative from the Liberal Democratic Party. Not to be confused with the LNP, though. Yes, people suggest that he got into the Senate because a lot of people weren't really reading their ballot cards very carefully, and he happened to be in the first position, and it said Liberal. And they was like, well, that's what I want. Yes. I think that's a, a fair critique. Yeah. In my humble opinion. Well, look, I'm probably going to give him a preference when uh, the voting comes around, just because he's entertaining. Unless this story changes my mind. No, I don't think so. I think okay, good. I'm on point with your um, belief in David's abilities. Yeah. So um, just for listeners who might not be familiar with uh, David Leanhelm's um, political mindset, he's probably what you could equate to a libertarian. Closest thing we have to libertarian in this country? Um, I've cherry-picked some... Um, quotes from his site uh, on a particular page which sort of describes his brand of liberalism. Quoting, Here we are in 2015 and the government still wants to know you ha if you have the right combination of genitals before it will allow you to press them together in holy matrimony. It disproves of adult smoking so much it is attempting to tax it out of existence while a black market springs up under its nose. 
It will soon have all phone and internet data collected in a convenient place so both it and hackers can snoop on you more easily, then make you pay for the privilege. Our way of thinking is new to people who have not yet figured out that the divisions between left and right are irrational and arbitrary. If I talk about letting people decide for themselves whether to smoke tobacco, people think I'm a right-wing nutter. But if I say the same about marijuana, I'm a left-wing loony. If I suggest we let gay and lesbian people do what they want, I'm a lefty. But if I support four-wheel drivers, fishers and hunters, I'm a conservative. Yeah, he's... I mean, there's an interesting thing. When you look at any sort of um, political graph, there's generally two axes between um, progressives and conservatives on, on one axis and then between liberalism and authoritarianism on the other axis. And Lionhelm's firmly in the centre yeah. and full-on uh, libertarian. It's, yeah. just, it's interesting. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of his positions. I, don't, I can't fault them, though. I think people should have the right to make it their own minds. If you want to marry someone, fine. I don't care. It doesn't affect me. You want to smoke cigarettes? I don't care. It doesn't affect me. You want to not wear a bicycle helmet? Fine, I don't care. It doesn't really affect me. I really think you should. <laughs> I would myself, but it doesn't affect me. Um, and a lot of his positions are like that. You know, he's like, look, you're an adult. Your safety is is up to your own decisions. And, and it's hard to argue with that. And I, I do like that aspect of him. And like, I, I sort of have to agree with him in a, in a lot of ways. And I, I like his approach. Now, you know, basically, he, he's very ideological. Hmm. He says, I'm a liberalist. And he pretty much applies it to any way he approaches policies, it seems. Yeah, he does. Does this affect me? No, then fine. Um, and that, that's what part of what makes him so interesting and part of what makes me hope he sticks around. Mm. So um, did you know that uh, David is a cat fan? A fa- like, as in the Geelong the, cats the or the feline form. kind? Um, he owns four cats. So if he had to pick between dogs and cats on that spectrum, would he be neutral and say, look, it's whatever works for you? Uh, I, Clearly cats work for him. He might consult Oliver, Tiffy, Ratty and Mir on the subject. He's four <laughs> cats, but who's to say? Um, that was for pure comic relief. That's not what I really want to talk about. Um, that was a rather long introduction into what I really want to talk about. And what I, what I really want to discuss was this week's hearing of the Senate inquiry into nanny state laws. This inquiry, set up by Senator David uh, Lionhelm, set out to uncover the ways in which the government unreasonably intrudes on the lives of Australians. And on Friday, it hit comedy gold. And you, you've mentioned the nanny state inquiry. Mm. You've been a big fan of it. Um, I find it interesting anyway. So I'm going to, in terms of the comedy gold I referenced to previously, um, quoting from Crikey Online magazine, Friday's hearing heard from the porn industry representative, uh, represented by the Eros Association's Joel Murray, who told senators that Australians illegally downloaded porn because of the lack of legal access to adult material. According to Murray, the reasons for these restrictions go back to the former PM. And this is his words specifically. Mm. Some fetishes used to be allowed within the X classification and it is my understanding that under John Howard as Prime Minister, the X classification was restricted in particular because the Prime Minister was deeply offended by the idea of water sports and female ejaculations. In fact, he claims the female ejaculation was not a true thing. So this was back in 2010 and I think... Uh, when um, John Howard introduced his legacy policies, one was um, banning yeah. semi-automatic weapons. He also made Which some I adjustments with as well. to um, the ex-classification. Yeah, look, it's interesting that the porn industry are making essentially the same argument that many Australians are making about the reasons they pirate movies and television shows. There's just shitty access. If you provide a decent streaming solution like Netflix has done, piracy drops. It's at a reasonable price. Some things, uh, I've, I've sent around a really interesting article by one of the guys in Sydney Morning Herald talking about Game of Thrones, uh, how he was trying to get it. He tried to do it the legal way. He tried to get it through Foxtel On Demand or Foxtel Play or whatever the, their live web service thing is called. Couldn't get it to work. Wrote an article about it. Foxtel made sure his worked and gave it to him for free. And he still slammed it because everyone else is dealing with the same problems he was dealing with. It doesn't matter if you fix one loud vocal opponent's uh, stream just for him. It's still crap for everyone. It's a crap service. It needs to be resolved. People need to have access to HBO Go. If people want to watch water sports, then they need to have access to that. I don't. Again, it doesn't affect me. Exactly. This is is where I I, I'm with Lionhelm on this. Oh, I agree. I simply don't care what people do in the privacy of the home. I'm a big supporter of his um, uh, inquiry into the nanny state laws because I I think it's important that a a country should um, reflect back on some of the laws and regulations it's passed to see was that done by. Because of arbitrary reasons, or was there what was the logical sense behind it? And I think it's important 
to always remember that when the 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 minutia or the details of regulations and laws being put in place in any particular government of the day that sometimes the, the small details are arbitrary you know in this classic case John Howard, because he didn't believe in female ejaculation or, and to an extent, was offended by it, said Australia can't, Australians can't have it. Mm. Well, why is he my moral arbiter? Why am I still suffering the legacies? Well, because he was one of the greatest prime ministers we've ever had. <laughs> um, three-term winning. Yeah, three-term <laughs> winning John Howard. They had a, he was his 20th anniversary of his first uh, win as prime minister the other week as well. They had a big party. I didn't celebrate. Um, with, uh, obviously, Tony Abbott was there and Malcolm Turnbull were there, sitting very close to each other but not talking, um, which I thought was lovely. A touching moment. Uh, it's, it's interesting. See, some of the other stuff, though, um, which I'm on side with, the, the, you know, the, the smoking stuff, you're going to be up against people like the Cancer Council, you know, who, who raise very good points that yes. this is a public health issue. And I don't think it's a black and white issue. I don't, that, that is the problem. When you, um, you know, give freedoms to some people, you take them away from others. There's always these impacts. And there's lots of, you know, um, valid points around the whole ban while well, trying to ban smoking issue. Yeah, we have other things here. Like you can't street drink in Australia. Mm. That's totally not a thing in other countries. You can have a beer on the street. I guess it was done here to, you know, quell homeless people and vagrants or something at some point in time. They just didn't want them on the street. So you can't drink on the street. But it's an odd law. It is. And I exercise my non-right to drink, drink on the street. And yeah, I, to be I frequently... Up on it. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Like I, I used to um, have a beer uh, on the street in, in when I was living in Mount Lawley. And I, and I still do when I live in Victoria Park. Never get pulled up on it. But I guarantee if I was in a poorer suburb, I probably would be victimised for that. Also, the, um, the ban on... Well, the enforcement of having to wear helmets when riding bicycles. It infuriates me. I understand the counter-arguments that... Um, they save lives to some extent and also if you're not wearing one you, you the the government has to bear of cost of putting you through the medical system etc but yeah i it's that's an interesting one as well i mean i it is a safety issue but at the same time every adult has a right to make up their own mind mm. and people do a hell of a lot more dangerous things than cycling yep. without a helmet on i so you know i mean anytime someone's speeding on the road way worse than not wearing a helmet on a push bike definitely you know like there there are so many things that i mean i know they're both breaking the law I just feel like the scale of that law and the, the costs that come from enforcing that, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it. And this is where I'm down with Lion Helm's review. Yeah, I, it, it's I'm interesting to see where it goes. It. And the more publicity it can get in the mainstream media. I mean, this was a very trivial example and it, it amused me to learn about... Um, the reason um, for the ban. John Howard's predilections or non-predilections, but... Yeah, this is where I think it's dangerous to have people making policies. I don't think the government has any role at all in dictating morality. They should mm. not. No. If you don't agree with that personally, that's that's your call and that's fine. It has nothing to do with anyone else and it is not your job to tell people how to live their lives. I mean, I don't believe the government should be in the business of marrying people. I no, think it's yeah, a discriminatory yeah. policy against me who's not married. Yeah, I think... And this is the other interesting part, you know, when you see um, you know tax breaks given to people with families and stuff. Yep. It's odd. It is odd. I mean, I get it. It wins votes. I get why they're doing it, but it is somewhat discriminatory as well. I mean, one of the... The most sensible um, ways I've heard of dealing with the whole marriage equality issue is the government goes, all right, we're in the business of issuing contracts, man, man, and woman, man, man, female, and female. We don't care. We'll issue a contract. We're not mm. in the businesses of marriage. Yeah, I think that's the, the best, that would be the best solution in my mind. If, if churches are against marrying gay couples, it doesn't have to be churches, but you know, whatever well, the venue. Well, churches do their own thing. Whatever venue is against it. it has yeah, no, but just has they no can have legal. their own ceremony. Yep. And then you apply for a legal license, mm -hmm. the same as anyone else does. If you want those tax benefits, and, and the two things are unrelated. Yes, agreed. Um, and that that would I think would be would solve a lot of the problems. But who knows? Who knows? I, I think that's also the very libertarian approach to this solution is that it has nothing to do with the government. They Mate, shouldn't be involved. Well, it doesn't. That's the thing. Yeah, um, you might be siding on the libertarian side of things. <laughs> me now, Frank, these days. Uh, it's it, look, it's interesting to see, and I hope Lionhelm sticks around. If there's a double dissolution election, we risk losing his influence on the Senate, which I have enjoyed. No, oh, I agree. Well, look, that's our sort of short, fast news section done, which obviously was a little bit not so short and a little bit not so fast, but it's something we've been guilty of I'm gu a lot I'm, of the time. I'm very guilty of breaking that rule. I feel like we should just have one segment on the show now just called medium something <laughs> length news, possibly fast, variable possibly length yeah. news items. <laughs> so anyway, moving on to the long slow, and these are the stories where I generally bring sound clips and have written more than one page of notes for our <laughs> listeners out there. I'd like to talk about a little segment I'm calling Spud Watch. <laughs> so everyone's favourite political potato and scapegoat, Peter Dutton, has had a bit of a rough week. 
News broke, and we talked about this earlier in the show, that the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea has ruled that Australia's detention of asylum seekers in their country is illegal. It constitutes a, a violation of their personal liberty afforded to the individuals by their constitution. It's a bit of a problem. Now, the Turnbull government has been left scrambling for a response, and we're drawing really close to a double dissolution election to get rid of both houses. This could be one of the most important deciding factors in who people elect. The ALP has been calling for Peter Dutton to get his ass on a plane to PNG and get the issue resolved. But to date, Pete's just hung out in Australia, doing spud things. He's decided this week to take to the friendly airwaves, or what he assumed would be friendly airwaves, of the Today Show to discuss what's going on and his position with Karl Stefanovic, a man who is really just an entertainer and not in any way a mainstream journalist. But what happened was quite funny. Uh, I have a clip for this. Uh, I'm going to frankly play in a minute. Uh, I should warn that I have actually edited Pete's sections a bit just to cut down on time and he was repeating himself. And I, I've kept the theme of it. But if you want to hear the whole thing, go online. Uh, hit it, Franco. And I've had uh, discussions with PNG government uh, over recent months. We've been anticipating uh, the Supreme Court uh, decision in PNG and we've been planning uh, for this uh, since uh, late last year. So there's a lot of uh, work that goes on behind the scenes. Hang on a second. You said that you've known this for months. You've been playing this for months. The, the Prime Minister yesterday said there was no definitive roadmap here. So what happened? How did it take you by yeah, surprise? I think, well, I think... Uh, no, well, it hasn't taken us by surprise. So what, well, we what you, well, what are you see, ready? Firstly, uh, well, well, when uh, the Prime Minister spoke yesterday, the PNG Prime Minister hadn't uh, issued a statement and we will work with uh, the PNG government. Uh, as I've said, I've spoken... To my counterpart, uh, Labor's out there running around uh, like shooks with their heads cut off, uh, saying fly to PNG. Well, my counterpart's in Africa at the moment. The important thing is that we uh, will work with the PNG government because we have been clear uh, both behind the scenes and publicly that people aren't going to settle in Australia. Well, gee, I tell you what, um, when the Prime Minister finds out you've said that, um, that you've known for months this was coming and, and uh, made the announcement yesterday that you had no roadmap, it doesn't say much about your planning, it doesn't say much about his planning. Well, Carla, I just don't know how you can draw that conclusion. Well, well because you say you've known for months this, this ruling yesterday. was coming, and yesterday he said we have no roadmap. How long does it take the Prime Minister to come up with a roadmap? Well, the Prime Minister's uh, been part of these uh, discussions for a long period of time. And I how long does it take you to come up with a roadmap context. if you've known for months? I love the pregnant pauses in there every time Peter's thinking, and there's this, this uh, back on script. The Prime Minister's known for months, and... Uh, it's just a reset. It is. It's, it's quite... It's like a... Uh, Rubio bot. Well, almost. that would definitely be part of their media training. Is that don't think, just repeat. Yeah, it was. It was awesome. It was awesome to watch. Uh, I had no idea that uh, Carl had any kind of journalistic integrity or abilities. Really, he's 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 prone to the, some of the most obscene gaffes on air I've seen in any journalist. He says such horribly inappropriate things. I didn't bring any today. I wanted to, but I ran out of time in my prep. But look, it's just impressive to watch. And he then followed all of that up. The whole thing's about six minutes long. I think I've, I've brought about two and a half minutes of clip. Um, he followed the whole thing up with a question about what's going to happen with those who've been legally granted refugee status, which is my second clip. What happens to the 850 asylum seekers on Manus Island, 482 of whom are refugees, classified refugees? What happens to them well, when it closes and when does it well, close? Carl, well, Carl, like, like many of them uh, before, so there are hundreds already who have returned from Manus Island back to Iran and elsewhere. Now, they've paid thousands of dollars to a people smuggler, they obviously want to come to Australia, but we've been clear that they won't. So we are negotiating with third countries. We'll continue our discussions with PNG because the PNG government has extended uh, an invitation for people to stay uh, in PNG and we'll work with other countries in the region. But we are absolutely determined uh, to make sure that the people smugglers don't get back into business because 1,200 people lost their lives at sea when Labor lost control of our borders and we're just not going to return to those days. You can't answer the question what happens. You've been told that this facility is closing and you can't answer the question as to what happens to those 850 asylum seekers on Manus Island at the moment. I love it. Yeah, he, he, can, he cannot answer the question. He can, all he can do is repeat the script. I love how he's like, you know, it's Labor's fault really. Yeah. Uh, try and throw them on the bus. Throws the PM under the bus. <laughs> he throws everyone under the bus except himself. I'm astounded this guy has his job still. And, like and obviously he's being kept around for this, you know, when it all blows up and it's another stolen generation kind of issue. They'll be like, well, Pete was on duty, so let's send him to The Hague to face human rights violation charges. But it's just, it's, it's mind-blowing how, how well, stupid this man is. 
and just how they keep him around. And I, I, I just don't understand. It's also a reflection of how stupid the policy is. It, and basically, what we're doing is criminal actions. Yes. And he's even there talking about, you know, uh, Stephanie mentions it, that there are 489, 482, something like that, people who've been deemed legitimate refugees, which we have a legal obligation to, you know, grant asylum to. Pete says no. We're going to work with third party countries. We're going to look elsewhere. We're going to find someone else. Taking. These guys have been held in detention. For a long time now, almost indefinite detention. Who are l- legitimate refugees. Been Le- legitimate refugees. They've gone through an arduous process. Yeah. A complicated process. Not to mention all of the pain and suffering they suffered in their homelands before they left. The fact that, that so many of their friends are probably dead. These are legitimate refugees. Pete says no. They're talking about trying to house them on Nauru for the time being, the 850 guys just mm-hmm. moving them to another, another area until that gets shut down by high court action in their own country. Well, and Peter also rants on about people smugglers. What has that got to do with legitimate refugees yes. who've gone through a very complicated system, been proven to be refugees, but it's something, no, they can't come because of people smugglers. What, what I think this, the good thing about this is it's, it's Channel 9, it's a mainstream channel, challenging this policy. It's sort of showing that maybe the public opinion is turning because I don't think Channel 9 would go out on a limb and just be like, oh, you know, we're going to now defend people smugglers. No, they know that this resonates with their viewership. And so they're going to attack Pete Dutton on this, which I think is interesting because he's a horrible man. Um, now, of course, the ALP are sadly no better on this topic. Their immigration spokesman, Richard Miles, thinks that we should negotiate with PNG to simply change their laws or maybe offer them more money to deal with the problem. As if, you know, you can just bribe a Supreme Court. <laughs> like, yeah, this is against the Constitution, but how do, do these little banana notes change your mind? <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Us as a first world nation who should be leading by example with good governmental uh, yeah. process, uh, trying to bribe a country to break international ro- laws. Well, and to break their own you know, national laws yeah. or to change their constitution. Mm. Like, oh, maybe we can just buy away people's human rights. It's nuts. However, there is one sort of glimmer of hope, and, and she's been a glimmer of hope for a while. Uh, the unfortunately soon to retire Labor, uh, federal Labor MP, Melissa Park, uh, she's not going to stand at this next election, so we're losing her. Member for Fremantle. But she took aim at both sides of the aisle this week, labelling our offshore detention system as a sick game that must be brought to an end. Now, she may be a little biased in this, in that she was a, formerly a lawyer with the United Nations, and she's been a long-term critic of this program. But she's bloody well right mm. that this is horrible policy that Hold on, hold on. You're saying, if you're right, you're biased. Yeah, wow. Well, <laughs> I, I guess, in a way, I mean, she's bi- reality is inherently biased, Frank. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, look, I'm hoping that, you know, people maybe start listening to her. She, this is sort of an area of her expertise, really. An, a lawyer with the UN. She kind of understands the international law. And yet everyone's like, shh, shh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We, we got this. They don't got this. No. And I, uh, unfortunately, I think Labor's gone far, too far down the Warren war to back out of how they've sort of been complicit to these policies. Yeah, I think they obviously recent, semi-recently decided that it was a vote loser to stand against this kind of policy. I don't think it is. I think enough people realise that this is just wrong. I, I seem to disagree with you. I still feel that mainstream Australia... Aren't ready for it? ...like this policy. They, they like... What though? Okay. They like the idea of us not taking refugees. They don't want to take refugees. What they don't like is being having their face rubbed into the fact that they're breaking international laws and treating people horribly. Yeah. They don't like that aspect. They want to... You know, keep refugees out, preferably without hurting them or without having to be told what they're actually doing. Yeah, an influx of refugees has always been good for this nation. It has. Like, it's always been good. We took Vietnam refugees at the end of the war. We've taken Italian refugees at the end of the First World War. It's always been Everyone's a refugee good for in this, this nation. Yeah, we, we were criminals originally. Um, and we came here on boats too. And I think that, it, you know, the, the only thing you have to, to lose here is more cultural diversity and a better understanding of the world around you. Hmm. And, you know, credibility internationally, which we have very little of on this topic. We're up there with Saudi Arabia, I guess. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, we start to see an end to this crazy policy. And hopefully, Potato Dutton loses his seat at the election. I would really like that. I think Christopher Pine's safe, given he's just secured those bloody submarines for South <laughs> Australia. <laughs> yeah. So the fix is not going anywhere. But maybe Pete. Maybe we can get rid of Pete. But can we do that, Australia? Can you make a pledge to help me get rid of Pete? Let's start the anti-potato game campaign. <laughs> How about this? We have a new campaign. What? No potato? <laughs> Question mark. And we just imagine what Australia would be like without this knobhead. <laughs> Moving on to our final piece for the discussion today is um, climbing Uluru. 
Previously known as Ez Rock, is a large sandstone f- rock formation standing at 348 metres tall in the southern part of the Northern Territory in Central Australia and considered one of Australia's most recognisable natural landmarks. It's up with the Great Barrier Reef. It's almost dead now. That, um, and your know, Sydney Opera House. You can't kill a rock. Nope. We're safe <laughs> on that one. <laughs> um, a notable date for Uluru was on the 26th of October 1985. The Australian government returned ownership of Uluru to the local... Oh, God, I don't even know how to pronounce this. I'm going to make a mess of it, but I'll try. Pit Jun... Jara Aborigines, one of the, um, with one of the conditions being that the Anungu would, that's another group, I think there was yep. two groups uh, or a subgroup of that tribe, um, would lease it back to the National Parks and Wildlife Life Agency for 99 years and that it would be jointly managed between those Aboriginal groups and the government. Yeah, I, I imagine it might even just be a subgroup of the Pinjatjatjara because I know that we live in... Um Excellent N- Noongar territory, by the way. Noongar territory, and there are fourteen sub tribes yeah. within Noongar territory. So I assume that the same is true in, in Central Australia. Yeah, that would make sense. Apparently, at that same time, um, an agreement was originally made between the community and the Prime Minister Bob Hawke that the climb to the top by tourists would be stopped. However, was later broken. And this is about this is the topic I want to talk about: climbing sure. Uluru. At the base of Uluru, our sign reads: "Our traditional law teaches us." the proper way to behave. We ask you to respect our law by not climbing Uluru. What visitors call the climb is the traditional route taken by our traditional Mala men on their arrival at Uluru in the creation time. It has great spiritual significance. So I personally, I am sympathetic to um, the wishes of um, those people about not wanting people to climb. However... I don't know if I can abide by it. In, well, you've been to New York City. I've been to New York City. You can't climb the Statue of Liberty anymore. You just you view it from from beneath. We both missed our opportunity on that one. I was there uh, in 2012, just after the towers came down, right after they made the law that you can't climb up. I oh, know they've in reopened it. They've reopened it, but there's it very stringent conditions. Well, I was going to say I'm okay with them. Right, well, if if a particular culture, who are you know custodians of a landmark, don't want people climbing it. That's just how it is. Well, that's one of the interesting arguments that's been put forth that they say, well, you wouldn't ask to climb the Vatican or cathedrals and stuff. But my, that's not that's a man-made edifice as opposed to a natural landmark. Sure. Okay. Anyway, make your campaign. Make your campaign. Why no, no, no I, this is one that vexes me because I, I do want to respect Aboriginal traditions and so forth. But I find that preventing someone travelling on a landmark is counter to my way of I, I think way it, of life. Is not the right way. I to think do, it's, but. it's interesting in that people generally go to Uluru to see Uluru to climb Uluru, and uh, as in terms of a source of income for the people of of that territory, um, it, it's an interesting decision to to prohibit what they can and can't do when they're there. However. Erosion is probably a, a, an issue for them. Like it, it's it's a natural landmark, it's a natural formation, and they, they just don't want people climbing up something that is a sacred site, and you know stamping all over it. I I'm sympathetic to their position, and ultimately, I I think I can't. I, you know I, I wouldn't climb it if I was there. So you would see the sign and go, okay, I'm not going to yeah, climb it. Yeah, I would. See me personally, I love climbing things. No, I do. I look. I understand that. I, I, look, rock climbing and stuff is is awesome fun. And I understand that you know the, the the desire to to get to the top, check out the view. The I imagine it would be an amazing view out over the desert. Yes, definitely. Um, I'm led to believe. Yeah. However, I, I still feel like you know if if this is their wishes, then the, the, there are other ways to see that. I guess. Mm. I, I don't know. It's I don't a, know how it's a come tough down one. on. I think it's well. Everyone has to make their own personal decision, and yeah, you know. I mean, I, I wouldn't condone people being disrespectful in the way they climb the mountain. So, like littering and yeah. urinating and Why, defecating the, and so forth would be, to, in my humble opinion, totally inappropriate. Yeah, the, the hassle is. I mean, there's there's so much or so little of Aboriginal culture remaining. Like a lot of it has just intentionally been killed off by the white man. Um, we had a Aboriginal blessing at work. I, I moved to a new office, and and we now. Uh, cohabit with a, another software company in the same overarching firm. I don't want to advertise who I work for, mm. but we, we now cohabit with an, an organization that does a lot of work with Aboriginal um, communities, rural communities as well. And one of the interesting parts about that is the very first day we were there, we had an Aboriginal elder come in and talk about their experience and, and you know sort of what's happening to the culture. And this, again, was, was the Noongar culture. It wasn't the Pinjatjatjara, so I could, can't comment on what's happening in Central Australia. 
but it was just interesting to hear their perspective on you know um you know the languages the, the, the individual languages of the Noongar people isn't being taught to the young kids anymore mm. all of the stories aren't being passed down the details of what plants you can and can't eat aren't being part, uh, passed down a lot of the plants that you can eat are, are gone anyway like they've just been cleared out of the city or they've they've been you know cleared out for pastoral land so a lot of um aspects of their culture are, are dying off and and i would i wouldn't feel bad if they want to hold on to some of those aspects that remain and and you know one of the major ones obviously for this uh, district is is uluru and the, and the sacred site there and i think that you know it's, it's 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 kind of fair that they want to keep that pristine because it might be one of the only things they have left no i and i agree in, in that regard and i i agree that they should let people know that they they would prefer people not to climb it yeah i think there's I think, that, I think there has to be that sort of interaction between the cultures definitely yeah we, well, we wouldn't want to. We wouldn't want um, to subvert their wishes in no. terms of, well, you know, um, hide them. Yeah, it's, I think it would be a lot nicer if you know we tried to embrace more aspects of their culture to, to help Australia preserve our history. Mm. Um, and and in some areas that means you know you teach the reasons behind why people don't want you climbing. Yes. Um, and I think so. I think the sign is good. I think that I would probably you know abide by it just because I you know I would feel bad. Stepping on you know the, the last remnants of someone's culture, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I would I would read the sign. I would empathise. I'd try and find out a bit more information about why they wanted. I still think though you climb I'd it. probably climb it. I'd try and be respectful. I wouldn't you know try and be in an Australian. You wouldn't get like a spray can it. out. No, El no, Franco. No, nothing, nothing like that. And yeah, it's it's something that I'm going to have to ponder because I'm vexed on the issue because um, you know it reminded me of an argument I was having or a discussion I was having with my mother about we were talking about um, political correctness in terms of trying to retire some of the more antiquated naming standards we have for things. So, for instance, we talked on this show about um, a particular piece of fauna in Australia that's colloquially referred to as black boys, mm. and you know the argument I was having with my mother was saying. What do you care for if it's changed its name? It doesn't really affect you. This and then I think I transpose that now to saying, can I apply that logic to me wanting to climb that mat, that um, Uluru? Does it affect me by not being able to climb it? I'm trying yeah. to think, is there an effect or not? This actually, interestingly enough, came up during our, our conversation with the Aboriginal older. They were talking about black boys and how they got renamed and how for some Aboriginals that they were kind of proud of the plant having that name you know, being yeah. named after the Aboriginal warriors and the spears standing up. And they were almost sad to see that name go away oh, okay. as well, which I found interesting, which I thought it would have been like, hell, it's highly offensive and racist. Mm. Um, but, and then they, she also explained all the terms that, you know, they called, like when we arrived, we were something, we were called in some ways something about being spirit people. We arrived on these ships, they didn't know what they were. And some of us looked like people that they had seen who were lost and they thought we were ghosts coming back, that uh -huh. spirits returning. Um, so that was the original name for the for the white folk, and then eventually we just got called white skins or pale skins or something. Yeah. Because um, once they realised that we weren't nice spirits coming back to, yeah. you know, honor honor the the living, um, and all that I found really interesting. Found really interesting, and particularly about the black boys, where they were like, "Hey, actually, this isn't, you know, it's a it's controversial within our own society." You know, some people were proud of that, and I feel that sort of information knowledge would be wonderful it could make its way through more mainstream channels like our schooling our media i do as well i was i, I really was trying to uh unfortunately they the original had to leave like we had this blessing at the start of our you know welcome to the the new building thing and then they went on for another sort of half hour um and she had gone in that time because i wanted to catch up afterwards and just touch base and go like, you know thank her for showing up and you know try and get some more information about things mm. um but I, I didn't get the opportunity which is really unfortunate yeah the um the machine of our government still sort of tries to reject Aboriginal culture in the main... Or maybe our society is just a bit lazy in terms of approach. Oh, no, we're, we're pretty uh, openly racist against some mm. Aboriginal people. Like Adam Goods copped ridiculous amounts of racism Definitely. Um, just for you know engaging in some stuff to help his uh, children, uh, not his children, but his um, the, the youth group he was working with, mm. the, the warrior dancers and stuff. I, I, that I don't understand. That should be something that we're totally fine with. There's nothing wrong with being proud about your heritage. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about this on a previous show about how in New Zealand they embraced the haka, mm. but when Adam Goods tried to display um, a war dance, it was seen as offensive. Yeah, I've, I still to this day have no idea how that's offensive to anybody. No, no yeah, I, I think it was a proud display of Aboriginal culture, which is fundamentally part of this country. <laughs> yeah, which and I, I would like to see more of that. Mm. Um, so, you know, Goodsy has my support. 
even though he's a filthy Sydney player, or he was, <laughs> uh, and they like to beat Collingwood. But that's fine. That's fine. I'm used to losing. Um, but the more conversations we can have about Aboriginal culture... Yeah, the, the I'm, actually, I'm pretty happy you brought this topic up because I wasn't expecting my own recent uh, experience to be relevant in this area. I didn't even think of talking about that, uh, and I probably should have. And on that note, I think we can call it um, an end to a show. Indeed. Thank you for listening. Good night, Australia. Bye.